funny little secret that this is where people your age tend to be smarter than a lot of people their age. Okay? Do you know that most people like it when you're nice to them? Did you know that? Do you like it when people are nice to you? Do you like it when people are mean to you? If I come at you like I'm going to hit you, are you like, ooh, glad to see you? No. No. Do you know what? That's, that's true of kids, but that's true of adults, too. That if you walk up to an adult and say, hey, you're pretty awful. I can't stand you. They're not like, will you be my friend? You know, because people like it when you're nice to them. So now if I wanted to tell you about Jesus, which do you think I should do? Should I say, I'm going to tell you about Jesus? Or should I say, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus? Which one do you think will work better? I want to tell you about Jesus. The second one, right? Both? <laughs> I don't think that's true. All right? Because if I come at you and say, I'm going to hit you, and Jesus loves you, you'll be like, uh, just go away, you're a weird man. All right? As opposed to just being a weird man anyway. But you know, there's a lot of adults that think if you're mean to people, that somehow they'll like you. And that's just not how people work. But most kids get that. If I want to be nice, if, if I want somebody to be nice to me, I should be nice to them. Now, sometimes people are just not nice anyway, but if you want to try to tell someone, someone something good, you should just treat them nice. And most kids get that, but you know, I know adults that actually have totally forgotten that. So I hope as you guys get bigger, as you guys go from being kids to being adults, that you don't forget that. You're in elementary school? Now, do you like... Mm -hmm. And does that, is that is, and when that happens, do other people like that? Yeah. Oh, they do like that. No. no. Oh, you don't I like that, right? You, I you mistold me. I thought you said, do they, do they not like that? They don't like that, right? Because they, if if you're not nice, yeah. people aren't going to like that. Yes, sir. Treat others the way you'd want them to treat you. That's a very good verse, and a lot of adults don't actually know that verse either. They, they say they know it, but they don't really know it. I'm going to talk to the adults about that today. Don't tell them. I don't want to spoil the ending for them. They're not listening. They're not listening right now. No, no, no. All right, you guys are listening great though. But you can go to children's church. You've been awesome. Thank you so much. I love that you guys match. That's awesome. Our reader today is Caroline. All right, we're reading from Titus 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly possessions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem for us from all lawfulness, all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous to do good works. Thank you, Caroline. We are in part two of our series as we're going through the book of Titus. And this is in preparation for the fact that I'm going to be taking a uh, break and going on sabbatical, but that won't change much as far as here at church, because the church is not dependent on me. It shouldn't be dependent on me. We have a team of shepherds, and even then, it's not even supposed to be dependent on all the shepherds. It's supposed to be dependent on each of us, but I thought it would be good to look at Titus, one of the pastoral epistles, and it's all about, Titus all about how a church is supposed to be. So in chapter 1, we looked at church leadership, what shepherds or overseers or elders are supposed to look like. And if we wanted to sum it up, it would come down to, he said, and he's talking to uh, people living on the island of Crete, and we talked about that Crete was a very corrupt culture. It was a very, not a nice place. They glorified dishonesty, uh, kind of being almost a cheat being a liar, they were very pursue kind of what feels good. So it was a pretty corrupt culture. So much they were so corrupt as we talked about 
that even now the word cretin still survives in our English language as being a bad person. And we got it from the island of Crete because the island of Crete had such a bad reputation that 2,000 years later, we still use their name as a sign of someone who's not very good. All right, so they were familiar with that. They're also familiar with Jewish legalism and the, the strict Jewish culture. And we saw Paul last week says, as you bring people out of the strict, out of the corrupt Cretan culture, don't put them into the strict Jewish legalistic culture either. That the church leaders should be a picture of God's kingdom, not either of these other two cultures. That the leaders are not an example of perfection, but of right attitude and maturity that plays out in their lives. And all that was in chapter 1. Now let's talk a little bit about culture. So this is every good deed, part two, for example. So let's talk about culture. Culture is how we live out our values. When you have a value, that value has to be expressed. Now what oftentimes happens for us is we confuse the value with the expression of the value. All right, I'll give you a real couple quick examples. For instance, um, dressing up dressing up. Now, that might be a value to say, hey, it is good to, to dress up and look appropriate. But what is appropriate? Well, for a long time in American culture, it's been a business suit for men and a dress for ladies. So that was dressing up. But then you might go like down to the Dominican when they if you go out into the bate, they, they don't ever going to have a suit. Dressing up for them might look different. You go over to Africa, and they'd be like, if you're wearing a suit, they'd be like, what kind of a clown suit is that? Because, again, how that's expressed in the culture changes. The value doesn't change, but how it's expressed changes. I've talked about before down in the Dominican, here in the United States, one of the things that you learned if you went to public school or almost any school, one of the first skills they taught you as a child is how to line up. And we line up well. You know, we can line up to go to lunch, line up to go to the cafeteria, line up to go to recess, line, to, line up to go back from recess. So we line up, get in line. And then because lining up is a value, then we also have a lot of other rules that go with lining up, like no cutses, or no cutsies, or no butts. You know, no button, no button, because you know, your spot in line matters. You can't just cut. And we, we're, we are masters at forming lines. Then we go down to the Dominican, and they don't form lines. They're like, what is wrong with you stupid Americans? Why are you just standing there? Because we did that once. We were unloading a truck. And so we Americans lined up, and we we're like, okay, when I you know, step forward, and somebody gives us something, and then they step forward, and once it's your turn, you get something. And the Dominicans were helping us unload, and they would walk by us up to the truck, and the guy on the truck was like, okay, American, gets one? Oh, here, here, get one. And he kept skipping the people in the line, which meant the Dominicans were taking two trips to three trips per hour one. And at one point, we're like, and we're like, they're doing it wrong. We got a lot. We got a line here. And you just walk right by. And at one point, one of the guys walked by and he asked me, he goes, why do you just stand like that? He's like, these people are stupid. Why are they? Well, it's not my turn. What are you talking about? And then we went for ice cream. And we went to the ice cream place and it was busy. And we got in line. Finally realized, you know, that counter's not getting any closer. And I kind of looked around and I went, okay, something's wrong here. Because <laughs> we're not going anywhere. Because people just filled in. They didn't push, they didn't shove, it wasn't rude, it wasn't chaotic, it was just not a line. So they just walked to the, so I was like, oh, I'm going to, all right, they just walked to the counter, I'm going to walk to the counter. All right, there's a spot. Oh, he stepped away, there's a spot. Oh, he stepped away, there's a spot. I'll have a chocolate, please. I came back out, my friends are still standing there. They go, how did you get an ice cream? I said, just walk to the counter. Well, there are people in the way. Yeah, just don't push anyone out of the way. Just when a spot opens up, take it. That's not how you do it. Yeah, it is down there. You never get an ice cream otherwise. That's a different culture. Now, they're not disrespectful. They're not rude. They, don't, they still wait their turn, but they don't express that in. We stand in a line, and I got to wait till this person goes. No, you just, when, you, when, it's your tur when you're at the front, it's your turn. That's how culture works. Now, we tend to, we don't like that. We don't like that. We want to just follow rules. We just want to follow rules. So just tell me, just put me in line. That's, I, said, I don't have to think. I just, did you move yet? Okay, now I move forward. I don't have to think. We come to the Bible, and a lot of times we try to read the Bible as a set of rules that transcends culture. Now, there, the, there are biblical truths that transcend culture. 
There are things that this is how God created humankind and how we're supposed to work. Then there are some of the ways that is expressed, and sometimes we hold on to that. So what do we need to understand about the Roman Empire? Now, the Roman Empire, which ruled Crete, ruled the known world as Paul and the other apostles are writing the Bible, they have this big, they span the Mediterranean basin. They have this massive empire, and their biggest concern is don't let it fall apart. There's all these, they're, they're a multi-religious system. In fact, the Roman Empire and 21st century America, super similar. Super similar in many ways. So, but the problem is, is they span all these different cultures and all these different people groups. All right, it's a super diverse thing because they've captured much of the world. So, and there's all these little religions popping up and they don't care. They don't care what you believe. They just say, hey, just make sure you pay, pay attention to the emperor and you'll be fine. They don't care. The big thing they care about is don't rock the apple cart because we're trying to keep an empire together here and there's always people saying, we need to tear down the empire and they're like, don't do that. All right? They care about stability. So they're super, and there's a whole bunch of people that are always looking to revolt. Notice that when Jesus, when the Jewish leaders wanted to get rid of Jesus, do you notice how the Romans really don't care about Jesus much? The Romans aren't like, oh, who's this Jesus guy? The Romans don't care. But the Jewish leaders care because he's messing with their thing. So like, how do we, but we don't have the power to do death penalty. How do we get Rome to care about Jesus? We'll tell them that he's threatening to overthrow Caesar. That gets their attention. They arrest Jesus. They bring him and say, he said he was going to, and Pilate says, so are you a king? You know, are you a pretender to the throne? Jesus says, well, who told you to say that? Pilate says, well, that's what they're saying about you. He says, well, yeah, but not the way you think. My kingdom is not of this world. That's why my followers aren't fighting you right now. They're not picketing for my release because I am no threat to you. And Pilate says, you're right. And he walks out and says, I find nothing wrong with him. We're not concerned about this guy. Well, then how come Pilate let him kill him? Because they're like, we're going to revolt. No, 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 don't do that. You want to kill him? Fine, just kill him. I, I'm, I'm out. He washes his hands. You want to kill him? Just don't revolt. Why? Because Pilate knows what's going to get him in trouble is instability. They his job in Israel is to keep things peaceful. And they threaten, he's like, they're ready to have a riot over this guy. So, hey, if they want to kill him, fine. Whatever makes for peace. This is a Roman value. Paul knows this. And so he's going to talk about this because now here's another minority religion. They don't know who Christianity is. It's just another Jewish sect that follows this Jesus guy who we killed a while ago. Who are these people? Are they good people? Or are they a bunch more crazies? And so Paul is going to, in chapter 1, he said, these are the values of a leader. Now he's going to talk to the church and say, here's what the rest of you are supposed to be. Let's look at it. Verse, chapter 2, verse 1, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. This, in other words, this is what is going to be appropriate. He's going to go through the population. Verse 2, older men ought to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. So he starts with the older men, and he says, be dignified. Pay this attention to this word, sensible. All right, make a little mental note, because we're going to see it a lot. Be sensible. Be sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Keep with it. Verse 3, older women, likewise, are to be temperate, dignified, uh, I'm sorry, reverend in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. And this is where some ladies go, hang on a minute, gossip. Paul, is he a misogynist? Does he not like women? All right, this is where we need to understand what Paul is doing. He is talking about Cretan culture. What was the culture of Crete? It was that older ladies, they've done raising their family, they got time on their hands, and they were what? They were busybodies. They like to drink, and they like to talk. And he says, your lady shouldn't be like that. So he's saying, don't fit the stereotype. Don't fit the stereotype that your culture expects of you, which is the older ladies sit around and gossip all day while having their wine. Instead, verse 4, they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, love their children, to be, oh, there it is again, sensible. Lost my place. Pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands. All right, 
Younger women, be sensible, be subject. By the way, the word subject here oftentimes gets translated obey. It's not a wrong translation. It's not perfectly accurate. It means basically don't disrupt your husband. Don't put yourself under his authority. It's not this whole subjective, <clears throat> it's about, this is a Roman value. Do you remember last week, it talked about that there were teachers that were coming in and disrupting whole families? Because a lot of these minority religions that popped up, they would come in and they would disrupt the family structure. And that, what, disrupted the social fabric of the empire, which really ticked off the leadership. They're like, you are disrupting the social fabric of our homes. The idea, the Roman ideal, was that the wife stayed at home and didn't fight with her husband. And he says, so go with that. He's talking about the Roman ideal. Be sensible, be subject. And he says this at the last part of verse 5. So the word of God will not be dishonored. We're going to come back to that phrase in a minute. Verse 6, likewise, a lot of times when this gets taught, they stop there. Likewise, so the rules aren't changing now as we change genders. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. There it is again, sensible. In all things, show yourself to be example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. We talked about that last week. Not open to be credibly accused of being bad, of doing something wrong. So that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. So first, this, and then verse 7 and 8. So verse 7 and 8 goes with verse 6, because it says, he says, in all things show yourself. It says, well, he's just talking to Timothy now. No, he started with, urge the young men to be sensible, and then he continues to talk to young men, but since Timothy's a young man, I mean, Titus is a young man, he's talking to young men. So six and seven go, I mean, seven and eight go with six. This is what the young men are supposed to be like, including Titus. But then we have this phrase, the end of five and the end of eight. The end of five, it said, so the word of God will not be dishonored. At the end of eight, he says, so that the opponent, in other words, somebody who's against you, will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. So in these two cases, he says, you're giving outsiders no reason to look at the word of God, no reason to look at the Christian message and say bad things about it. So how the young women are supposed to act and how the young men are supposed to act, and this is actually pulling the older women and older men too, says so that outsiders, in other words, these are not people that share your Christian values. It's not so your pastor doesn't think you're doing the wrong thing. It's so that your unsaved neighbor who doesn't share your values, who may even be your enemy, who may not even like you, will have nothing bad to say. That's a whole different field, isn't it? Because usually we say, well, you know, they, they're just so wrong, they just hate us anyway. He says, you're not going to give them any ammunition. We'll come back to that in a minute, because then he's going to go on. And so this is, you're, you're going to be, basically, you're a positive impact on society. Society doesn't look at you terribly. Verse 9 and 10, this actually extends to household slaves. Now, this gets problematic. We say, so Paul was okay with slavery? I thought slavery is evil. Slavery is evil. Slavery is a bad thing. All right? Paul is not talking about how it should be. He's talking about how it is. And they had household slaves, which is very different than American slavery. But these household slaves, it was very, very common and creepy, like us having a butler and a maid type thing. But there was a reputation for them, too. They kind of had it not easy, but they had it easier than the slaves that worked elsewhere, and they had a bit of a reputation for being a rebellious, and Rome was terrified of a slave revolt, because the empire lived and died on slavery. Re watch Spartacus, if you want a reference of how the Romans felt about slave uprising. They were terrified. But household slaves, they tended to be kind of casually rebellious. I mean, they didn't want to, like, mess up their thing, but they're kind of like pushed back whenever they can, and they tended to be kind of not always good because Crete valued not being such a good person. Notice what he says. He says, so urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering. And then here's the phrase for the third time, like in the end of five and the end of eight. So that they will... 
adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. In other words, you're making the doctrine of God look good. You're adorning it. So you're a Christian slave? Look how, how good you are. Look how nice you are. It's not saying slavery is good. It says, but if you're a slave, be good. Then he goes into salvation. Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness. There's your Cretan elements. And worldly desires, Crete, and to live, there it is again, sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Be sensible in this present age, righteous and godly, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So he says, live sensibly, godly, righteously in the present age. Sensibly being a word he said again and again and again. Hope in Jesus' return. And then he says, be zealous for good deeds. Now, English, we have this word good that we use for everything. The other day I bought oranges I, a lot of evenings I have fruit for supper, so I've been eating oranges. So I bought oranges at Hannaford, and I got home, and two of them, they were broken open. So I took them back. I'm like, ugh, they're open already. The peels split right open. They were bad. Now, when I say the oranges were bad, I didn't, like, open the package, and they went, give me your money. All right? They hadn't gone morally bad. They just weren't good to eat. All right? Say, so that was a good orange. It feeds, you know, it, it, gives the, it gives to the poor. No, it's not that kind of good. We mean good that means pleasing, right? You say, that's a good painting. We just mean it's pleasing, it's beautiful. This word here that's translated good is that word. It's to be beautiful, all right? So a better way to think of this is beautiful deeds. It's kalos. There's a different word, agathos, which means good, more intrinsic value, which we'll see next week. He's going to mention that. But here he says that you are zealous for beautiful deeds. It's speaking to the appearance in the Roman world. All through here he's saying, this is how people should see you. And who are these people? These are not your fellow Christians. Because you're this minority religion, this little group. They don't get you. They don't understand you. You're not, you don't fit with the Jewish thing, with the, the, the strict legalism and the, the laws, but you're not a Cretan doing, hey, whatever feels good, I like it, it makes me happy. He says, so what are you? He says, you're going to be different, and when they look at you, they're going to see good. They're going to see good. So let's unpack this, because Paul is here very concerned. See, we, we read this, and we read it in isolation, and we don't read it paying attention to who wrote it, who he wrote it to, and why he said it. And we just say, well, these are the laws that God has for people. Yeah, but why, where did he come up with these laws? Why did he say these were the values? Because he's all the way through, he keeps referring to who's watching. It's how you express it in that culture. And he's concerned for the public witness of the church in an empire that doesn't understand them. He wants them to build a good reputation for their community. I call it a good community reputation, but they can go both ways. A good reputation in your community, but a community of people that has a good reputation. Those people. When they say, look at those people, do they say, we like them? Or do we go, huh, who are they? Because the, in the culture, the Romans were worried about disruption. The Romans were worried about upheaval. And these little groups kept popping up. Because why? Because the empire, an empire is hard to keep because people don't want to be ruled. The Jews were constantly rebelling because they didn't like to be ruled by Rome. They wanted to be their own people. And so they were always rebelling. But it wasn't just them. And so Rome's really concerned. And so every time a new religion would pop up, Hey, if you want to start a new religion and you want to try to populate it quickly, you know how you do that? You find out what people want to hear and you tell them it. Quickest way to get followers is to lead people where they want to go. 
So if you've got a whole bunch of people in the empire like, I kind of hate Rome, I kind of hate Rome, and you want to start a new movement, you know how you get a lot of people in the door? You say, we hate Rome, and they go, hey, where do I sign up? And so that was happening all over the empire. And so these new little religions would start, and all of them were based on that we're going we're gonna to defy Rome. And Rome was like, oh, eh, and they hated it. Paul says, don't be like that. Rome's going to look at you and go, oh, well, they don't seem too bad. And that messes with us. But all the way through here, he's like, make sure that when Rome looks at you, they see something good. Now, he's not talking about compromising when it comes to the stand. And this is what you see all the way through the Old Testament. This is very consistent with how Jesus lived and how the Old Testament saints lived. Think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've talked about this before. What did they get in trouble for? Rebellion? Actually, no. They were workers. They were serving. But then Nebuchadnezzar said, oh, and you need to bow to my image. They're like, we can't do that. No, no, we can't do that. So we're not going to bow. And so they got in trouble. They didn't die. And if you read to the end, we go, <laughs> he stood up to Nebuchadnezzar. Actually, they, they sort of did and they sort of didn't. They didn't bow. But remember how the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ends? They get promoted. <laughs> because they're such good government workers. Let's take Daniel who's like in his 70s, and Daniel is so good serving Darius, he's such a good, loyal employee that his fellow workers are like, that guy drives us nuts, and we can't, he's too good, he's not corrupt. How do we get rid of him? Well, he likes to pray, let's make that illegal. <laughs> we got it. So they make prayer illegal, and he goes, and what does Daniel do? He goes, well, I can't follow that. I'm still loyal to the Lord, so I'm going to pray. And he gets arrested, convicted, thrown in the lion's den. And what happens that night? His unsaved boss, his pagan ruler boss, isn't like, oh, I finally got rid of Daniel. He's like, I love that guy. And Daniel's probably sleeping like a baby in the lion's den because the lions are just sitting there purring and not, not eating. And the king, the pagan king, spends all night going, hope he's okay, hope he's okay. I don't believe, oh, man, what did I do, what did I do? And the next morning, first thing, he gets out of bed, he runs down, Daniel! Are you okay? And Daniel's so mad at the king, he goes, Oh, king, live forever. He goes, You're okay. Oh, thank God. That was stupid. Thank your God. Whew. Get him out of there. And who, who, who set this up that I put my best worker in there? Those guys, put him in. <laughs> and Daniel goes back to work for the pagan king. Why? Because the pagan king said, You're great. Why? You're so loyal. You're such a good worker. You have this weird religion I don't understand, but when it comes to the things I do understand, you're very loyal. And that was the testimony. When they go to Babylon and they wanted to rebel, and what does God have Jeremiah tell them? Settle down, build a house, build a garden, and pray that your city has peace. We are praying for the Babylonians. They captured us. They're godless. Yes, and try when your civilization works well, when their civilization works well, it's good for you too. Be known as good people to Babylonians. Here it's to Romans. Paul is worried about the church, and so he counters with a message of peace. He says, be what? Respectable. We're going to see this more next week. If you don't like today's message, I warn you about next week's because Paul is just warming up. Don't get mad at me. Take it up with him. What does he say? Beat the stereotype. That's the message. Beat the stereotype. Be better. Be nicer. Be wiser. Be gentler. Be more respectful. Be a different kind of dad, a different kind of husband, a different kind of wife, a different kind of mom, a different kind of kid, a different kind of worker, a different kind of slave. When they see you, they'll go, wow, that's different. You don't fit the stereotype. What are the stereotypes? They had two. They had the Cretan stereotype, which was you're in it for yourself, and they had the religious Jewish stereotype, which is you follow all the laws, don't do anything wrong, because boom, 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 boom. And he says, don't follow either of those stereotypes. Be something different. So when they look at you, they go, You're, that's beautiful. 
And that was, a, that was the history of the early church. Even when persecution came, usually how persecution came, it came because later emperors trying to keep the empire together because what? It was failing. Why? Because without God, everything fails. And so as the empire began to fail, later emperors come along and they say, okay, how do I, how do I reunite our people? Let's double down on the worship of Caesar. That, that will be something, they can still have all their religions as long as they also worship Caesar. And then the Christians say, we are totally loyal, we're totally with you, and we can't bow to Caesar. And so down then they say, well, you're a threat to the public peace. We're, we're, we're really not, but we, we can't worship Caesar. And that was when persecution came. But a lot of times persecution was very uncertain through the empire because a lot of people didn't want to persecute the Christians because they were the kind of neighbor you wanted. They were the kind of people you wanted to be around because they were different. They weren't in it for themselves. And they were respectful and they were wise. In other words, he's telling you're a different kind of a person and a different kind of people together as a community one that the world sees positively. Now, it doesn't mean that the world's going to love us. The Bible doesn't say the world's going to love us. So don't, because when it comes to that we're supposed to give ourselves up, the world say, wait, I have to give myself up? I want to live the way I want to live. Say, oh, you can't do that. Can't do that. I'm not allowed to just do whatever I want. Neither are you. But one that the world sees positively is say, you're some of the nicest people we know. And that has not always been our legacy as a Western and American church. Sometimes it has been. Especially of late, I'm not sure it's the legacy that we're always putting out there to a world full of opponents. So let's talk about that. Do we relate to our pagan world this way? To quote what Paul said, are we beautifully different? Let your light so shine before men that they see your good, beautiful works and glorify your Father. Like Darius. Like Nebuchadnezzar. I don't believe your theology, but you're nice people. Thoughts? We're way too close to home. Do we relate to our pagan world? We live in a pagan world. We're living in the Roman Empire. We're living in Babylon. Is this how we relate? Beautifully, beautifully different. Not just different. Beautifully different thoughts. <sighs> Scared y'all. They did really well first service. No, no, no. Um. <clears throat> oh, sure. Well, I find that that it, most people don't, <laughs> mm. because we we see reaction. You know, you you got to have no temper. <laughs> most people they lack don't they they like that they do it, but I think that that. Uh, over time that people realize I can remember when I went to work and a lot of people swore and all kinds of stuff around me but after a while they never did because they they see what you and it's not you're not important but God is and and if they got to see Christ in you but uh, sometimes it's not as easy as it looks not at all I think that today, especially in America, um, that we thrive off negativity, right? So when we turn on our news or we're watching TV, we hear the stories that reflect Christianity in a negative way most of the time. But I will say this. So recently I've been posting about Bean's Corner, right? And sharing, hey, my family's doing cocoa and cookies. Or, hey, on the 24th, we're going to be doing the warming center, so come hang out with us on school vacation. The positive comments that Beans Corner gets from this community and how they feel about specifically this church, I feel like you, we, (laughs) as a community are starting to break that, right? They're like, oh, what a beautiful church you go to, meaning what beautiful people, what beautiful things you do. And we need more stories like this shared. Mm. Different in a way people appreciate. They go, wow, 
You're, 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 you guys are really nice. <laughs> We're trying to be nice. Yeah. <laughs> I found that as, as many negative things as you see on Facebook, that when I've found people that are having problems, I can private message them and just simply say, I'm praying for you today. And at first, sometimes they don't really react. But I found over time, they'll say, gee, your prayers really work. I was, well, <laughs> not because of me. <laughs> it's who I pray to. Yeah. <clears throat> they'll say, well, how does that work anyway? And I've found quite a few people that are not believers, but just simply by saying, and not everybody responds, but some do get curious just because I say, well, I'm praying for you today, just as simply as that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all we need to do is let people know that we care. Well, what does the Bible say in 1 Corinthians? If I stand for what is right and loudly proclaim the truth in a way that's not loving, I'm just really noisy. I'm just somebody banging a pot. Just an unpleasant noise. Different in a way they can appreciate. Sorry, never look at the front. That's why I'm not supposed to walk back there. I know you just ignore me. <laughs> um, no, I was thinking while you were talking, um, and then while she was talking also, um, about... Um, our perspective of the early church, um, how they were told to relate to others, and so often as we're reading through um, the New Testament, especially through the epistles, and we are like, you know, oh, well, they, they did this wrong, and they did this wrong, and what was wrong with them? Why were they allowing this in the church, and what was this? And it's, it's easy for us to judge the early church the same as it's easy for us to judge the non-Christians around us, for us to judge other churches, for us to judge other people within the church. <laughs> um, anything to make ourselves feel better, right? And um, I think that that, that all, all goes together in how we don't relate to the world the way that we should because we so much more easily get caught up in that instead of looking at the, the beauty of what people in the early church we're doing right, what we can learn from them, the, the things that people around us um, need instead of what we can tell them is wrong. Or um, ultimately, when it comes down to it, just the fact that they are people that Jesus died for. We are people that Jesus died for. Mm. He loves them as much as he loves us, and that's the only Ultimately, the only way that we should be relating to them is as somebody else that Jesus also died for. Mm. Dangerously close to next week's message. <laughs> Titus 3. Um, I'm just thinking as you're talking, I'm not sure exactly what it is that finally breaks people's eyes open or their hearts or their ears open. Um, coming from trying to practice under a more lawful uh, way, but having that Holy Spirit, there's always this something inside that's burning that doesn't feel, I don't know, it's like a little rebellion all the time, something in there that's telling you. So I would say don't give up on those people that are caught in the law. Mm. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, and I'm so thankful for witnesses like yourself, you know, and lots of others who have shown me a different way, a beautiful way, um, and a true relationship mm. um, without having to worry about lots of laws. Mm. Yeah. Let, let's talk about some of this as it relates to Bean's Corner. And you say, oh, there's actually some of the things we've been doing. This is why. This is the mission. Cookies and cocoa. Because our culture today is like their culture. We're, we're very close to Crete in many ways. So our culture, if you're right in Maine, what do people understand? They understand, hey, hey, whatever feels good, go with what feels good, live your truth, live your way. They know that, right? They also know the, don't you dare do that, follow the rules, religion. They know how churches work. So they walk in here to Cookies and Cocoa. What's the first thing that happened again and again? If you did Cookies and Cocoa, you saw it. The first thing they did is they came out and they went, so how much is it? Why? Well, because nobody just gives that stuff away. There's always an angle. We said, I'm sorry, we're not selling it. But, well, these toys here, those are, I, I have to buy those. No, 
So why are you doing that? Just be nice, because we love you. That's not only not like the world, that's not like the church either. <laughs> Isn't this a fundraiser? Nope. They, when we did our first craft fair, I had somebody come up to me and said, you're not keeping the money? We're like, no, that, that, that first craft fair we gave to the um, elementary school in town because they were trying to do a playground project. And every time we've done a craft fair, we've given the money. This last craft fair, half of it went to one mission, the other half of it went to help uh, send the people to the, to the Dominican. It never goes into our opera operating budget. Why? Because it's not for us. And people are like, so you're a church that's doing fundraising not for you? You don't fit either category. Weird. Well, that's different. So you're actually just nice people? We're, we're trying. <laughs> but they're not used to it. But look at the opportunity that gives. Look at the opportunity. And that's why he says in verse 8, your opponent has nothing bad to say. What are they? They're an enemy. They are not a convert. They're not sitting there going, hey, I really love your values. No, but they go, but I gotta have to admit, you're really nice to me. And there's a lot of times we're not doing that now because we are being terrible to people. Every time I talk to Tej, he's a, now he's one of us, shepherd here at the church, but I says, how you doing? Why? Because he's in education. <laughs> Nothing going on there right now. <laughs> Anytime I run into one of the superintendents, if I get a chance, I say, so, so how you doing? And you know what happens anytime I've asked the, the previous one, I, get to, I was at a funeral, and the superintendent, who's not the superintendent now, showed up. And so I pulled her aside when I had a chance. I said, so, how are you? And of course, so the kids, first service, I gotta tell you, the little boy was my volunteer. And I went like this, and he goes, oh, I'm gonna go get an army. <laughs> I was like, that's perfect, because when we come at the world like this, that's what they do. And then we go, well, they're just against us because we're Christians. No, they're against you because you walked up to them with your fists clenched and you threatened them. And then you said, and we're standing for God. No, you're a jerk. For Jesus. But when you walk up and say, how are you? They go, oh, you, you care? Yes, you child grooming pervert. No. It's, it's tough to be you, isn't it? Yeah, people are mean. I'll pray for you. I'm sure it's really hard to have people hate you all the time. And they go, wow. Oh. And then they find out that I don't agree with them at all. And then they really don't make sense because if I agreed with them, well, anybody who's nice to the people they agree with, but you're one of those people that are nice people you don't agree with. Why are you like that? And that's what's transforming things. That's why the church in Muslim countries is doing better than we are. And I've brought this up before, but when the, they killed those Coptic Christian men a few years ago, they lined them up on the beach, put them in white robes, interviewed them, and then cut their heads off because they have to kill their enemies. And what happened next is a story you didn't hear, didn't make the news. The families of those men that were beheaded, they said, we wish you hadn't done that and we forgive you. Don't you hate us? No. Nope. I mean, we don't, we're definitely not in favor of your actions, but we forgive you. And it freaked the Muslim clerics out. They were like, what power is that? I mean, we understand anger and retribution, especially in the name of religion. That makes sense to us. We understand holy war. That makes sense. But forgive your enemies? We can't do that. That's not how we treat our enemies. We have to kill the enemy. We kill the infidel. Why would you forgive us? Oh, what is this? It's the power of God for salvation. And we'll see that again next week because he's going to bring this around even more in a way that's going to make you pretty uncomfortable maybe. We are different from the Cretans. We're not self-indulgent. We don't do just what feels good. We don't just live our lives for ourselves. That's how, that's how the world lives. But we also are different from the religious Jews. We're not just a bunch of law followers that do the right thing and make sure everybody else does. Instead, we are completely different, an entirely different kingdom that is rooted in Jesus, verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for beautiful deeds. 
And we need to present to our world a radical Christ-likeness that actually looks like Jesus. To say, I live different, and I'm different to you in a way that you go, whoa. And that's what Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good work and glorify your Father's heaven. This is the definition of salt and light. Because they say, man, if ever I'm broken down, you know who I want to have come across my path? A Christian. If I'm in a contentious meeting, I hope there's a Christian there. Now, what do you think our culture is saying? I hope I don't bump into those conservative Christians. They're terrible. They'll cuss you out. They'll tell you how bad you are. They'll treat you as an enemy. I have plenty to say bad about them. But that's why I hope that we as a church at Beans Corner, that our community says, and I don't always agree with them, but they're awful nice. I have some very dear friends who they know that their, their choice of their sexuality is wrong. And they know that I hold to that. And they're my friends. And they know I love them. And they know I love them, and they know I think they're wrong. It's only fair they think I'm wrong too. But listen, our world, what happened to the Roman Empire? Paul's worried about the Roman Empire. Why is Paul worried about the Roman Empire? Because you know what happened to the Roman Empire? It collapsed. Why did it collapse? Because it was godless. You think our civilization will keep going? Godless? No. When it collapsed, what was still standing 2,000 years later? The church. And when everything starts to collapse, where do people go? But if you've been like this, they ain't going to come to you for help. They aren't going to say, okay, what I was trying to do, what I, my values all didn't work. Can I talk to you? No, you. That's not Christ. Who did Christ like? Who did Christ hang out with? People that the religious community said, you are terrible people. Why would you hang out with them? And they went, I actually really like hanging out with Jesus. But he never told them they were right. He just loved them, and he treated them well. That's what our call is to Christ's likeness. Now, we got one more chapter. Whew. If you didn't like today, probably just stay home. Don't. I want you to come. But Paul is going to, Paul's just warming up, and he's going to take this the rest of the way as he talks about how do we meet the world. So next week's called Meeting the World. But may we be a radically Christ-centered community. a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Let's pray. Father, just thank you. Lord, this is tough, but 2,000 years later, your teaching here to Titus is so relevant today because your word is true in every culture. And we find our culture dangerously close to the Roman culture. Lord, may we be radically like you, not like the Pharisees and not like the Cretans, May we embrace purity. May we embrace the fact that we have to give up ourselves and we may have to surrender things that we really want to do and that feel good, make us happy, and we still can't indulge them. May we hold ourselves to a standard that isn't based on making ourselves feel good. And sometimes that's going to mean some uncomfortable decisions for us. But Lord, may we also not be like the Pharisees, but instead be in favor of the good of our society not because they're right, but because they're wrong, because they need another voice and a different way of going about things. And may they see the good in us and be drawn to it. And then, Lord, only you can change their selfish hearts. But, Lord, may we show them you who came and died for sinners like us. Thank you, Father. May we as Bean's Corner proceed as that's our reputation in our community here in Franklin County and the surrounding towns. May they see in us you. And may we see many of them come to know you as a result. Thank you, Father. May you bind us together as community. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. soul, my soul, are you weary as
troubled no night so dark that our eyes cannot see there's light so bright as we look to our savior life more abundant and free life more abundant and free turn your eyes upon jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. O oh God, our God, you are with us in darkness. Your word, your light is leading us on. Our hearts can hear two weeks. Next week we'll do Titus 3, and then my last Sunday for, for the sabbatical we're going to do the questions again. So if you have questions, the main purpose of the questions originally was if this, these things I'm, we're teaching as we dig into the Bible, maybe they're like, oh, that's not how I remember, not how I thought about it. So if, if it's raising specific questions, put them in the box. But some of you just have general questions that have always been burning in your mind, so those are good too. Any questions, fine. But uh, well, I answer the questions two weeks from today, so if you have questions or if this has brought up new questions, put them in the box, and we'll answer them on our, uh, my last Sabbath Sunday before the break. Father, 
as we go out from here today, as you send us into the world this week, as we are continue to be the church, even though we're not in the building, as we are your people, as we are a community, Lord, continue to bind us closer together. May we find more ways to be together and, and to together pool our resources to serve each other and those around us. And Lord, may our reputation as a church be one that points towards you. May how we treat those around us be something that people take note of uh, because it's based in who you are. Thank you, Father, for your great love for us that you came and died for us. May we cling to you each day in Jesus' name. Amen.